This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow Cookie to Range, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven. And today I'm joined again by one of our regular visitors or regular speakers, which is Josie Lewis, our head gardener at Perch Hill. And we had a really nice question, actually, from a customer. What were the plants that Josie and I would recommend that would give you glorious flowers and sort of presence in your garden for longest? And so, in a way, if we were each cast off to a desert island, which would be the six plants that we might take with us? I always think, in a way, more if I was sent to prison and I was allowed to make a little garden, which were the six plants that I would try and persuade the prison to allow me to grow. So I'm going to kick us off with Amelanchia. And I remember working in a garden about 10 years ago that had multi-stemmed amelanchias in grass. And I thought they were the most graceful and elegant things whenever I went. In winter, they had wonderful uh, sort of branch bough shapes, these multi-stems. They were quite well established and very nicely pruned. In spring, they're absolutely beautiful because first of all come the copper flowers, sorry, copper leaves, followed by these very pretty very simple blossomy flowers. And then they go over. And then in June, really early, you get these beautiful sort of medium size, but quite small, not a crab apple size berries. And I love, we have now three amelanchias in the Dutch yard here. And I open my back door in June and there is a flurry of blackbirds, both female and male, and for about 10 days, they are all, apparently, in our Dutch yard, all feasting on these amelanchia berries. They absolutely seem to love them. And I guess there aren't that many things burying so early in the year in June. And then finally what happens is that they go a beautiful array of, of sort of reds and ochres, real sunset colours. So I, I just think, yeah, amelanchias for a smallish garden like the Dutch yard is here, Almost any setting, whether it be grass or brick, as we have here. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful plant. And um, I, I love it more every year. Yeah, very nice choice. Now, when you, when you first suggested this subject for a podcast, I found this really difficult. Pinning it down to six. Yeah. Well, I might go on to seven. Um, it, it's, it's so hard because every time you think of one, you say, oh, that, but it, that's equally nice. Yes, um, it's true. And I, I've seen your list and I see that... Uh, some of my favourites are on yours. So uh, <laughs> I I'll said you tip. could nick a few, Josie. <laughs> uh, so, well, I'll start with uh, Trachylus spermum jasminoides, the evergreen yeah. climber. Yeah. Uh, what, what a star that is. Mm. Uh, we've got it here growing on the oast. It grows up to the balcony on the oast. Uh, it's so scented, uh, flowering, I mean, like, like jasmine from the name. Mm. and when's it flowered? June, July time. Yeah. And it is just, it is the most, you know, I'm a bit funny about scent, yeah. you know, like paper whites I can't bear and no. lilies, but the, the scent on this is absolutely stunning. And yeah, an evergreen climber, it, it, it's in sun there. It does well in shade. Yes, I didn't uh, know that until recently, but yeah, yes. Yeah, it's quite happy, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's the most forgiving, wonderful plant so, yeah, I'd have that climbing through my prison bars. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, so I'd have Amelanka in the corner of our prison yard. <laughs> and then um, I would add to that in the next layer down three shrubs. So my number two would be hydrangea limelight. And I, I, I'm i pretty sure that Josie would have had this on her list yeah, too. I would. It's the hydrangea we love most here. It's got these extraordinary pyramidal-shaped uh, flowers that come out quite sort of golden deliciously green initially then they go increasingly blonde and white 
so they're first of all sort of vanilla and then they go really quite white and then they turn pink and then only in the late autumn do they go brown and at all stages I think they're elegant they're not too big they're not the flowers are not too densely packed in their I think they're called panicles the whole sort of pyramid they're very easy to look after they grow happily in dappled shade they're pretty tolerant of drought I mean pretty tolerant I say in that what we find here is if it's a really dry summer they actually just delay flowering and so you'll actually get them flowering from September rather than in June and that's quite nice in a way because it just means that when the rain comes in September you then get this much later performance so yeah that would be my number two easy to grow very long-lived wonderful cut flower wonderful for pollinators all-round cracking plant yes prune back in March very well easy done. yeah prune yeah. back in March yeah so for my shrub layer I'd go for salvias we have masses of them here, don't we? All, yeah. all varieties that you could think of. And we're always trialing new ones. But if I had to pick one salvia, it would be Sarah Potosi, mm. that slightly shocking pink one. Mm. Oh, it's, it's so good. It's been with us at the bottom of the steps from the Rose Garden for years, hasn't yeah, it? it has. Really hardy. It, mm. It's such a good plant. And of course, we, we underplant our roses with these microphylla salvias to try and protect or help protect against black spot, <laughs> which it, it seems to work, doesn't it? There is yep. some measure of protection against the, the diseases. So all our roses have uh, diff different salvias matching the colour of the rose or complementing it. Yeah. Nachtblinder is another lovely, isn't it? Which, it is. Which goes with anything. Love it. So, yeah, I wouldn't be without salvias of any sort. Okay, good. So they're our next layer down. Yeah. And another to add to that layer... Uh, Josie is not so keen on us as I am, <laughs> but I was brought up on this plant. I mean, that sounds odd, but it, <laughs> there was tons of this plant in my parents' garden. And it's one of the Euphorbia caracas, so one of the biennial Euphorbias. So you get the, what, the evergreen sort of tussocks of it, but actually the stems that flower then die back and you can clear them out, but more will come from beneath. And so they're a biennial flowering spike but you always, at any point in the year, are left with this nice framework of these silvery, grey, uh, sort of uh, hummocks, tussocks. And I love the acid green flowers in spring. I particularly like John Tomlinson, which has not the brown eye, but the green eye. And yeah, I just love them for permanent structure. They self-seed, some would say a little bit too much, but they self-seed in sheltered sunny spots and yeah, as I say, it was all through my parents' garden. I, I love uh, Crete very much. It grows wild all over Crete, and we have tons of it here. The one downside, of course, with any euphorbia is its sap. And when you are cutting out the biennial flowering stems um, after flowering, after they've bloomed and gone brown, so we do that in sort of June, July time, take super care, only do it on quite an overcast day, not on a sunny day wear gloves and even maybe wear glasses or, you know, something to protect your eyes because if the sap gets in your eye, it's very painful. But don't, I would say don't let that put you off, but then that's me. Josie, your next one. I've got to put this one in, but it's another, it's another shrub and it's Abelia. Ah, oh, you know, I, I just, love it too. Wherever I go, whichever garden I've worked in or whichever house I've lived in, I always have abelia mm. and I'll take cuttings from it. And I bought a cutting here, didn't I? Mm. Now we've, we've got a lovely one established here. Beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Scented, brilliant for the bees. Yes. Flowers yeah. six months of the year. Yeah. Yeah. It's evergreen. Beautiful. Evergreen. Yeah. I mean, not, not in all gardens evergreen, but uh, here it stays evergreen, doesn't it? And mm. at, uh, at, at home it's evergreen. And mine have got into uh, two and a half, three meter high Wow. shrubs it's just stunning mm. and when the flowers drop the, the that sort of bronzy yes, calyx still calyx. looks like a flower it really does um yeah. so yes yeah, stunning shrub i wouldn't be without good good okay well i'm going to move off shrubs now and i'm going to move on to a climber and actually for my prison yard i am definitely going for cabea the cup and saucer plant and i know we talk about this quite a bit 
I know Arthur and I both bang on about it quite a bit, but ush, it's just, we can't not include it. The cup and saucer looks exactly like that, a little cup sitting on a saucer, big trumpet bells, wonderful if you sow it early in the year or get seedlings that are a decent size by the time you put them out in May, then you will get flower this year. They are tender perennial climbers, so they will get cut down by frost. We've actually got one that we've dug up from the garden here because we've got a stand at Chelsea this May and Josie's trying to protect it to bring it into flower. So we're hoping we can have it growing up over our shed, which is our stand is in the shape of a shed. Anyway, we're going to do a whole episode on our Chelsea plans at a later date. But Cabea scandens for me is an absolute must have. And it would be very good for hiding the gloominess of the prison walls. And even I could use it like Jack and the Beanstalk to <laughs> escape because I could climb up the vine and hop over the wall and get Josie to pick me up the other side. Yeah. So um, <laughs> Cabea scandens in all ways is a truly splendid plant. Yes, it is. We always have it here, don't we? Up yeah. at, always up a TP or wherever. Yeah, my next my next one is uh, there's so many pelagoniums that we have and that I love, but ha- in the end I had to go for lavender lass, uh, very delicately flowered. Mm. Um, it's quite spreading; doesn't mm. get very tall, thirty centimeters, but it'll spread to fifty centimeters or so. Uh, I looked at it in January; it was still flowering. Wow! It is just a the most stunning. I, I love it. I think because it's so delicate. So yeah. Some of them can be a bit. In your face, which is good as well. But this one, yeah, this one came out top for me. Oh, well done. I know I like that idea. It is very delicate. It's like like sort of filigree, sort of almost like grass engraving, isn't it? It's sort of so delicate, the form of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. No, I agree. I love it. I love it. So my next one, I would have to have a dahlia for long performing gloriousness. And it's impossible to choose because we breed our own dahlias now and there are so many good ones. But I think genuinely for floriferousness and for showiness of the flowers, I would have to choose Dahlia Molly Raven. It's excelled in all our trials here. You know, it's just jam-packed full of flower, whether it's in a pot or in a border. goes on flowering well into November. It picks well. Yeah, it's just truly glorious, named after our younger daughter. And yeah, I would be very sad not to grow many dahlias in my prison garden but definitely molly raven would have to be number one to cheer me up yeah dahlias uh when i saw that on your list i thought well (laughs) you wanted that that one uh so i've gone for the annual tajatees constance yeah i mean i love i love burning embers yeah very beautiful and airy but tajatees constance is such a good doer and gives you such a good uh in in pots it's quite stunning isn't it because it fills the whole pots it has great presence yeah it's not like the french marigolds it, it's not more refined all. yeah absolutely love that yes it takes some deadheading but it it doesn't demand all your time yeah and it'll pay you back in in shovelfuls because it, it it's not much for a packet of seed is it no and for what no. you get back yeah yeah i, and I wouldn't course, be without that brilliant for pollinators and a great edible flower yes true yes we tend not to use that so much but i don't know why yeah. Pro- probably because it's in pots so they the yeah. <laughs> cooks think they can't pick it yeah yeah so my final one would definitely be petunia tidal wave red velour so Petunias are something I'm crazy about because of their velvet texture and their luxurious, um, strong growth and that they cascade down the side of a pot or out the front of a border. But without doubt, I mean, we've probably trialed 20, 30 varieties here over the years, and that's not including the doubles, just the single petunias or the small ones, which are the saffinias. But tidal wave red velour is just literally how it sounds. So it's a deep red. It's the most wonderful velvet texture, but it's such a strong grower. You can grow it from seed, you can grow it from cuttings, and it flowers, honestly, from, I mean, late May, early June, and particularly if you can overwinter some inside, and it will flower right the way through to the winter. And it's a good cut flower. 
It's a perfect container plant and it's brilliant at the front of a border. And it actually will climb up through a shrub. So it's so vigorous, it can push its way up through other plants. So it's just a, a, a really great a sort of border blender as well. So that would be my number six. And um, yeah, each one are just wonderful garden enhancers uh, for performing for as long as possible and as flowery as you like, uh, apart from uh, one or two shrubs there. And what's your final one, Josie? Uh, so I'd have to go for Erigeron carbinskianus, yeah. the Mexican flea bane, the little tiny daisy that you see growing uh, ar around steps. And well, I'd have it growing out of the brick walls. Yeah. Because uh, if, if it finds a place where it's happy, uh, then it'll grow for you. I've, people have come up to me on open days and whatever and said, you know, how do you get it to grow? They can't get it to establish. So I usually advise buying a plant mm. and putting it where they want to have this established and the seed that you know don't deadhead it the seed will blow from that plant and yeah. find where it wants to be yeah uh, and then hopefully you'll have it in your garden forevermore because it finds where it's happy and then it, yeah it'll keep going it's it's green throughout the the winter yes. you know we, we cut them back in spring to tidy them up and maybe halfway through the growing season as well when they get a bit uh they get a bit leggy sometimes but they they're just always there and always brilliant you grow them in pots if you want they yeah. make great table pot yeah. uh so contents. easy yeah that's drought it. tolerant yes long flowering yeah easy from seed good no, for I wildlife yeah, yeah great for wildlife just like daisies in the lawn yes yeah, yeah. No, they're great plants yeah i wouldn't be without them so that's our our cream of the crop the the six things that both of us would recommend for really any garden and if you don't already grow each and every one of those i would really seriously consider them because that's after both of us gardening every day for 30 years so those are just simply the best plants the list might change good point <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to me and Josie Lewis on our long, favourite, floriferous, splendid, glamorous plants. <laughs> and next week, in a way, a continuation of the same theme, I'm joined back by Arthur Parkinson and we're going to talk about what we would like and what we will give for Valentine's Day. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.